Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing supporting our veterans during National Military Appreciation Month with special guests. Michael Blecker, Executive Director at Swords to Plowshares in San Francisco, and Paul Cox, who is a board member at Swords to Plowshares. So thank you so much for joining us, Michael, Paul, and I'm going to set you up. I'm going to go uh, over to you, Michael. It's National Military Service Appreciation Month. We should appreciate our our uh, military men and women um, every single day, and those people identify differently every single day of our lives. It's so very important that we not only have ideals, but we also have the strength to stand behind them. And it's important to uh, for us all to realize, particularly those who have not served in the military, that an effective military must function in ways that are completely unique. And so exiting from service comes with some real challenges. One becomes acculturated into a particular modus of operating and then making that transition uh, can can uh, really uh, be difficult. And, and in addition to that, there are healthcare issues, housing, um, family understandings, and so on and so forth that need to be dealt with. So. Michael, uh, let's start with you just sort of giving us the lay of the land of the services that you provide and also the experiences that our veterans have as they exit military service and the kind of support that they receive both from the VA, but also from organizations like yours. Yeah, thanks. Uh, You know, we're a, uh, you know, nonprofit uh, California Corporation 501c3, right? And so uh, we're like in the heart of it. Our admission is to help vets. You know, we understand that war causes wounds that last beyond the battlefield. And so we're there to address all those wounds that we see. And we're in the community. We see how they're, they're expressed in the community. So over the years, we've developed certain programs trying to get vets jobs in the labor market, trying to get them back into school on those issues, you know, trying just like, uh, connect them with their fellow veterans in their community. The idea of community is very significant for uh, folks getting back, uh, you know, getting adjusted. And over the years, a lot of veterans have had some issues with housing. So, uh, you know, we've been around since, you know, the the, uh, mid seventies. So we've seen this transition. Much of this came from the transition from the Vietnam war veterans coming back and needing help. And so over the years, all that counseling, uh, helping vets with jobs, helping vets with, uh, you know, getting uh, getting back into school. And then starting in the mid-80s when so many vets uh, were homeless, a significant number of vets homeless. In fact, <clears throat> the number was nearly 300,000 veterans were a part of the homeless population. They were But we see this cycle repeat, right? In the in the aftermath of the First World War, we had the great encampments yeah. and the and the yeah. and the march on Washington yeah. and then the riots that that, that occurred. Point. Yeah. When they were pushed back. And, and in the Second World War, we also had a, a, a very uncovered uh, issue. Right. It was kind of hidden because it was the great war and the victory and right. so on and so forth. The the stress. And then yeah. the Korean War also in the aftermath of the Korean sure. War. So this is not a new problem. Right. We're just coming up with better solutions, no. aren't we? Right. Uh, but the solutions really weren't there when we started. Right. We had to sort of like make the solutions. Right. We had to sort of like try to get the institutions to do a better job, the VA, you know, our healthcare system, that kind of thing. And we're in the, we're in the thick of it. We've grown, you know, now we have, you know, we have uh, 200 employees. We have a budget of almost 30 mil. You know, we have like two office sites in San Francisco and Oakland. We have like seven housing sites. We have over 430 permanent supportive housing sites because we've really had to do housing. <clears throat> the city, you know, the public sector wants us, has asked us to step in to help, you know. We like connect the VA system with the non-VA system because the VA is so, it's a really rich healthcare system. You know, it's a it's a national healthcare system. Uh, it's available everywhere in, in this country, throughout the nation. They have a big responsibility. So we try to help in our community uh, to get those systems working better too. And Paul, you before we got on um, to the to the broadcast, you did a really interesting thing. You basically parsed the the problem. You you talked about um, what 
uh, which veterans are are more likely to be affected by the by um, a transition challenge and and uh, more likely to experience need after exiting the services? Could you just uh, lay out that analysis uh, for us a bit here so that we know who we're talking about? Well, sure. I mean, I think uh, military service can be really stressful for anybody uh, and is every for everybody um, to some degree. Um, but a number, but it's very common that people who serve in the military um, have some difficulties after they've after they've left the military. And uh, I think that's true for Michael and me both. But we seem to be functional at this point. But some people just never sort of get over that period, uh, especially combat veterans, but also people who've experienced um, abuse in the military, military sexual trauma. Um, but and then injuries and PTSD and TBI, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. Training accidents can be very devastating. What is TBI? Uh, I'm sorry, a traumatic brain injury, which seems to be the um, signature injury of this war that was not recognized in previous wars. Shell shock was sometimes probably very often was caused by right. um, brain injuries, um, but it wasn't recognized as such, it was just recognized as somebody who's just seen too much war. Um, but it may have very well been a physical injury. So, and t- so TBI is the physical injury of, of the most current forever war that, uh, that we see. And we're having greater protective gear, right? And so while the, while the body might remain whole, the interior, uh, the, the organs, including the brain, uh, could be injured in a way that is invisible and actually manifests over time, uh, sometimes with with a great delay. So it's it's much more difficult to see somebody, not see an injury, and understand that they are indeed injured. Right? Yeah, and actually, in, in recent wars, they've re- they're really loading these soldiers down with a lot of gear, even protective gear. Uh, so a lot of soldiers wind up with skeletal muscular skeletal issues. Mm-hmm. Um, that, uh, even though, you know, I carried a lot of weight in Vietnam, it didn't seem to affect me, but boy, when somebody's running around in 110 degree heat with long clothes on and lots and lots of armor, um, and plus the ammo and their food and whatever else they need to be carrying, uh, it can really be, um, strenuous, even on a young man or a young woman. And so um, we're also talking a little bit about um, how people enter the services. Um, you had made, made the point that the officer corps um, has an easier time um, making the transition because we are in a knowledge economy. And so if you take a look at the officer corps, which, which is focused on uh, the knowledge part of planning and, and command and logistics and so on and so forth, those knowledge skills are more easily applied than a skill that happens to be uh, more tied to a physical activity or a combat activity because we're not engaged in combat in civilian life, right? Or at least we shouldn't be. So so you have this this real disconnect. So uh, Michael, what kind of services, if you were going to lay out the services, and by the way, this is not a special San Francisco thing, right? If you go into New York, you'll find uh, counterparts. If you go into Chicago, you'll find counterparts. If you go to Toledo, Ohio, or you go to small town America, you will find veteran support organizations that are dealing with these same issues within their environment. So talk a little bit about about what kind of services and how you segment those services. Uh, Yeah, you know, we we have this term, you know, this wraparound term where you know, you help, you know, you're, you're, you're set up in the community, right? So you're there where veterans are, right? So we have these drop-in programs and, and we also do outreach. So we're, where the vets are, we, we're there to try to, you know, help them back into the system, you know? And so part of that is making sure you have, like, you receive them, you're available, you know, and, you know, you treat them with the respect and dignity that they deserve. So you have some cultural you know, your vets, vets serving vets, or you have this close connection to veterans. So you understand their needs and you try to, you try to provide what they need, what wraparound care they might, if they're on the street, then, you know, you got your work cut out for you. Right. 
Uh, if they're in crisis, typically they're in crisis. You know, when you're low income and, uh, you know, you're, you, you have a lot of stress, right? Just the stress of being impoverished and trying to get back on your feet is a big deal. And so we're sort of, you know, you, you know, we just sort of help start in that process. We have housing. We have mental health counselors. We try to get them enrolled into the VA healthcare system. Uh, we have attorneys because people don't realize that there are great veteran benefits, but some of them require, you know, advocacy or claims assistance. You can file a claim with the VA, right? Because there, you, you could have stress that's connected to the time you were in the military. No, and that's called disability no. compensation. And you can actually get income for that. Uh, but it doesn't come to you automatically. You have to establish your claim. And sometimes you need the help of an attorney to do that. And attorneys aren't that plentiful in this area. So we've been doing this work, you know, for years and years and have developed some expertise. We have attorneys there to help us. A lot of veterans ended up getting kicked out of the service unfairly and received bad conduct discharges or what we call bad paper. Uh, during the Vietnam War, there were over a half a million veterans who had other than honorable discharges. That's a big number. That is and that's big. like a lifetime stigma. And that could be for a number of things. It could be very unfair what happened, right? It could be a result of your own dealing with stress of what happened. And now your difficulty readjusting back to the time and finishing out the time you're in the service, right? There's a, anyway, there's, there's a number of things that when you get into it, you realize these are needs and you have to have a sort of some, of it, some ability to address these, quote, wounds. And so that's how it starts. How do, you, how do you deal with that? You better have the resources to hand. And that's what you're going to see if you're really, you know, in real time dealing with this issue. And, Michael, don't forget to mention employment training. Right. So we, we find employment for veterans. We help prepare them for, for um, interviews and for, um, for employment. And that's, that's, a, that's a key thing for a lot of veterans is they just, they don't know how to re do a resume. They don't know how to, to conduct themselves in an interview. And uh, we've helped many thousands of veterans get jobs. Good and often really, really good jobs. We've um, we just completed a poll. We said, "What is the most urgent challenge faced by veterans?" And we and people came down to three. Interestingly enough, housing was not mentioned. Uh, the three that were mentioned were uh, mental and physical health challenges. Uh, uh, civilian and VA care services are not up to the challenge, and there needs to be some gap um, gaps that are filled by organizations like yourself. And then the challenge in transition to not, to the non military work culture those three areas. Um, do you feel that housing is one of the uh, major challenges, uh, Michael and Paul, or do you feel like- well, it, um, It's certainly a challenge for a veteran that doesn't have it. Right. <laughs> you know, that is, and that's a life crushing problem. I mean, it's for whether a veteran or anybody else to, to not be able to know where you're gonna sleep tonight, or just to be able to hang on to that little corner of, uh, of, a, of a storefront uh, entry that you sleep in for weeks at a time. Um, is so debilitating and, uh, and, and it's, so it's really key um, for a small segment of the veterans population, but not insignificant. I think actually I would, I would pick some different things for the, the major challenges. I think that one of the challenges is, is aging Vietnam veterans and younger veterans. I mean, some, some people that are Persian Gulf veterans are in their sixties, you know, um, and, and the health problems that come with that and the VA's, the, the need for the VA to make adjustments. Uh, and they are talking about uh, opening up new nursing facilities for really elderly veterans. The second one is younger veterans are often walking around with hidden injuries, as I mentioned before, TBI, PTSD, moral injury, um, MST, military sexual trauma, and the like. And the third thing I think is, is an effort, it's a political problem, which is the, the, the really push to privatize the VA, uh, which is an amazing system. It's got its problems and everybody's got complaints about how they, their services at the VA were. But, it, but the solution to that is not to push veterans who need specialized care into, um, into the strip mall um, medical centers that don't even know anything about them, don't keep a history of them. Um, don't understand what the special needs that veterans have. 
enter sometimes. You know, Paul, there's gold in them, their hills, right? Um, <laughs> so you know what privatization is about. I, it, absolutely. It's about let's get some of that money that the VA normally gets. And it's going to strip, it's going to really strip the meat off the VA and leave a skeleton that's really just a payer if, if it goes to the full um, effort that they're trying to, that people, some people are trying to put into it. Yeah, I don't understand the, the logic behind taking um, a, a private health, health system, an insurance system that by all accounts from all across the political spectrum doesn't work particularly well in the United States uh, in comparison to uh, our colleagues in the G7, um, you know, uh, uh, developed countries, um, and then expand that that dysfunctional system into an area um, of of uh, where where the VA, as you say, for all of its faults, um, is doing a heroic job. Those people who are serving the VA, who often themselves are veterans, um, are, are are really um, managing a, a a huge system. And then then you're providing some complementary areas. Could you talk a little bit about why a nonprofit can sometimes be much more nimble, much more responsive than a than the VA, right? Because in a sense, you're you're working against time, right? If somebody's homeless, Paul, that night is the most important night of their life, mm-hmm. right? And then the next night will be the most important night of their lives. And so you're working against time. So sometimes, Michael, as you say, you can't necessarily go through the attorneys and the the applications and so on. Talk a little bit about how you gap fill um, where there where time is of essence and you need to be more nimble. Yeah, it's almost like you're triaging, right? Like a medic, you're seeing the most wounded and you're tending to that need first before you get to the next and the next. So when you're in a community, that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with people on the street who are in crisis and you're trying to get them off the street to get them sheltered. And then once you, you know, because you can't really do anything if they're unhoused, right? They're going let's, to continue let's to define suffer. Crisis. Crisis is when you don't know where to turn. That's crisis, right? You, no. It could be, it could have any source, but you right. just don't know where to turn. That's yeah. what a crisis is. Or And the stress it generates, right? You get under tremendous stress, mental health stress, and which, you know, has a debilitating effect on your overall health, you know? You carry that stress around and, and, you know, we see veterans who are who have health issues uh, that are uh, typically in someone 20 years older than themselves. Right. Almost every veteran uh, that's in our housing program has multiple health care issues. They're in physical pain, but they also have issues with, you know, advanced respiratory problems. They have, you know, it's uh, diabetes, you know, up and down and as well as depression. And so there's multiple issues. Right. That they're dealing with. And so um, I think a nonprofit is nimble, is can do that. And, and the thing about what we can do is sometimes is we are, we're out there and we can, uh, you know, we can we can identify the gaps and say, you know, the, the institution has to do a better job in this area and, and pull those two, the, the non-VA and the VA, because, you know, it's it's a you know, the problems are immense and the resources are strained. So. Yeah, so one, is a, one is a system, right? You have to you have to treat people as the as cohorts, as a member of a cohort, right? You have to go right. through a workflow and so on and so forth. And you get to actually look at somebody as an individual, right? That's true. I mean, that's the nonprofit. Yeah, that's that's what you do, one person at a time, right? You know, and I, I should say that the VA is very helpful in this matter. They don't provide housing. I mean, they have they have what they call CLCs, uh, community living centers that are really convalescent homes um, for people who are injured and can't be on the street, don't need to be in a hospital, but can't actually go home um, because of their injuries. But they don't provide housing. They do provide funding for outfits like SWORDS um, for housing and for rent support uh, and for kind of what we would call Section 8 housing, um, hud vash uh, uh, and other programs that the VA funds and source to shares and other nonprofits like us um, administer that money and, and, and provide those services to the veterans so that they can stay off the streets. 
Well, we had done an interview with Susan Angle, uh, director of the Homeless uh, Veterans Initiative, and Mark Johnson, who was at the time, I think it was during the Bush administration, acting assistant secretary for the Office of Community Planning and Development. And you see some of the um, some of the um, the partnership amongst different uh, federal agencies with the VA to provide uh, housing support <coughs> and, and and funding um, throughout, but you can definitely act so much faster, right? Somebody walks in off the street, you can actually um, uh, start to support them right away. Mm -hmm. no, no forms need to fill, be filled out. I mean, eventually you probably have to fill out forms. Michael, how do you how do you deal with the funding side? I mean, you're talking about a $30 million budget, you're talking about 200 employees, those folks have to be paid. Uh, talk about the sources of your income. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I think we run a very lean organization. We have like a 12 and a half percent uh, our administrative our administrative fee, infrastructure, if you will, overhead. That's and right. uh, oftentimes the contracts will not pay you that. So you have to constantly fundraise to sort of fill that gap. But, you know, you have to like uh, you have to have a finance department. You have to have contracts. You have to administer everything. You have to make sure all the I's are dotted and trees are crossed. You know, take care of your staff. Right. I mean, it's a terrible situation uh, where you have folks who are like client facing clients and in the field and having to staff houses and difficult housing settings 24 seven, right? Making sure those folks have the salaries, salaries, the benefits they need, right? Uh, you know, to make sure they have, a, you have, a, you, you, you know, you protect people, have a good plan. So those are all, and then you have to like figure out making sure your money comes in and goes out and, uh, you have to have the right people, in, in, you know, in place. But I think we operate a very lean kind of uh, agency, you know, and we really focus on things like, you know, if, issues like uh, diversity and equity in the workplace, right? Who gets promoted? Why do they get promoted? How does staff feel about their jobs? You know, taking care of our staff is very, very crucial. Well, you also have to have a staff that looks like the people who are being served, right? Yeah, so, um, you know, if you, if, if, if you don't, then you end up with sort of embedded um, alienation. How many people in your staff are veterans themselves? You know, that's an excellent question. We have over a third are vets themselves, right? It used to be much higher, but that's sort of the, the nature of this work. And so, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, so we, it's about a third are veterans. And, well, and some additional fraction are spouses of vets. Right. Yeah, yeah they're all, they all, have, they all have deep cultural connections. Yeah, and there, there's tremendous uh, commitment to what Source does by it's because sometimes the work is not all that pleasant, and it certainly doesn't pay all that well. Yeah, but people we have this really step up. Yeah, we have this program called Combat to Community, where it's all about training and making folks culturally aware, like first responders and others who encounter veterans. You know, uh, letting them know what the issues might be, right, so they can do a better job and de-escalate issues that come. Uh, that occur right in their in their in their engagements with uh, other veterans. So the cultural aspect is very important for us, to us. Paul, do you find that there are certain uh, skills that um, are uh, that that come from a, from military training that are very applicable within civilian life? That you find that there that, that there may be some patterns um, where you can actually take advantage in a positive sense of all that training, of all that acculturation uh, to help uh, people find um, a, applicability for those skills within a civilian setting? Uh, speaking personally, no. I mean, the Marine Corps taught me how to shoot and take orders in March. Um, and I've, but using the GI Bill, I've managed to get a really good education since then. But yeah, sure, there are plenty of jobs in the military that are, um, that have, um, you know, that provide skills and, and the maturity uh, for young people to mature into those that they can use to uh, uh, later on. Um, and some of the problem getting jobs for some veterans is they don't know how to express those skills in a resume or an interview uh, in ways that get them um, that that translate from the military MOS to uh, a job skill. Even though those they exist, they may not work like that. But I, I, I'm not an expert at these issues, and that was not my personal experience. 
Well, and, and Michael, are you, uh, in terms of, of the workforce development and the jobs uh, side, you talked a little bit about resume building and about uh, the communication piece. Are you also connecting to employers directly? Uh, yeah, we try to, we have like an employer advisory committee that we try to work with. Uh, you know, we try to like build support among uh you know, the, the workforce, we have contracts with the Department of Labor to actually place veterans in jobs, uh, you know, and you, and, and you work about, you know, the, the pluses that come along with being uh, having served in the military, uh, the teamwork and the team building and the ability to respond and address issues. Uh, and you try to work with that on that framework, you know. I'm going to uh, ask a closing question. I'm going to um, leave it to uh, first Paul and then and then Michael to, to answer. We asked a question, what would be the best way to ensure veterans have housing, health care, food, and, and employment opportunities upon retiring to the military? And we asked a number of different options, tax incentives um, through nonprofit uh, community and church organizations, government programs, and, and um, it's every individual's and every business's responsibility to help our veterans. So everybody in America is responsible. This is the interesting thing. Most people answered that it's every individual's responsibility to help. In other words, we should all walk down the street and think about this issue. Uh, we should all um, get up in the morning and think about this issue. We should all in our businesses be thinking about, about this issue. Um, could you, could you uh, first, Paul, could you talk a little bit about how we should be thinking and what we should be doing um, uh, about this question of taking people who have uh, served our company, taken a chunk of their lives and dedicated it to that type of service and then need to make a transition into a non-military setting? What should, what should we all be doing to help more? Well, I, I certainly think that um, people have a responsibility to our society. Um, and that's one of the reasons many of us went into the military is, you know, in order to uh, be part of something bigger than us and to serve our country and to uh, express our love for our country. Um, and I think those are those are important qualities. Um, However, I also don't think it's it's all not just individual responsibility. I think the government has responsibility for this. Uh, if we're going to send young men and women off to war, we damn well need to take care of them when they come back. And if we can't afford to do that, then we can't afford to have a war. It's an articulation um, of the social compact. If we're going to have people who serve and those who don't, then at least the people who don't serve in that capacity can serve those who serve. Sure, sure. We should um, all be involved, right? It's all, it's all about protecting a set of values and a, and a democracy, and, and we should all be viewed as being involved in that, right? Yeah, sure, yes, yes. Michael, what can we do? What, can, what, what practical action can we take, aside from writing a check to Seward to plowshares? But, but, um, what That's my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I think the, the idea that veterans are some sort of outside us, uh, we need to frame it as if they were veterans, if that was, and it could very well be your brother, your sister, your father, what would you want for someone who went through a serve? What would you want them to have when they return, right? Think of it in a very personal way that those veterans out there could be your brother or could be your father or could be your son or your daughter. What would you want for them, right? You want to make sure that their health is good. Their stress is relieved. They have opportunity, right? They have availability of, uh, you know, they can uh, get housing if they need it. They can go to school. A lot of, you know, I went, I joined the military to go to school, right? The GI Bill, that there's those things. So this, us and them, think of them as part of the family, right? What would you want for your family, right? What kind of, service? and I think that whole idea about the cost of war is enormous, right? And people never think about the returning, those who return from that war, right? And the cost that we owe, right? We owe those folks, us, you know, we got to take care of ourselves. 
It seems that patriotism is more e- is easier to express than than um, to enact in our daily lives, and so this is part of our uh, of the question of the uh, of this time is that how do we act in our daily lives to strengthen the country and to support those who have served the country. Michael Blecker, executive director at Swords to Plowshares in San Francisco, and Paul Cox. Uh, thank you so much for being a board member of, of Sword to Plowshares, and thank you so much for your support of, of our veterans and our communities. Please thank your boards. Please thank your funders. Please thank your wonderful staff who are helping people that need help, our brothers, our sisters, our fathers, uh, our mothers. Uh, thank you so much. Everybody stay safe, and we're going to be talking about uh, on Thursday, learning opportunities and the benefits of children's museums. So hopefully um, uh, those of you can, uh, who can attend will, will be part of that discussion as well. Take care, all. Thank you. Thank you.